passed a climate bill, then the House passed a climate bill. It went into conference. And actually, that's why we were there till about 7 o'clock in the morning, because they were trying hard to negotiate and come to agreement on the climate bill, which they could not. They could still do it. So I just want to let you know that I've heard and it, the reporters have reported that the House and the Senate are continuing to meet the conference committee on the climate bill. And of course, our session ends you know, December 31st, and there's no money in that bill. It's just policy. So that could come forward during informal session. I'll talk about um, what the governor did in about the climate in just one moment. Um, and so we also passed, as I mentioned, a supplemental budget, but we have received since then a close out supplemental budget, which is another budget to close out the year from the governor. On that supplemental budget, many of you know, I'm sure, the governor kind of picked out the bills um, that had to do with solar siting from the House and the Senate climate bills, and she attached it to the supplemental budget for a lot of reasons, I think. One, her priority for the climate bill this year was solar siting. She's made no, you know, she hasn't hidden that. Um, as many of you know, because you attended the UMass Solar Forum that Senator Comerford and I and UMass hosted, there, there's an awareness that we set these big goals in 2050 to go renewable, and we're not doing enough of what we have to do to keep to make sure that we are actually able to meet that goal. And I think there's an, a, um, a concern that unless we accelerate our development of renewables at a very big level, as you probably heard at the UMass conference, we're not gonna meet those goals. And um, right now, at least the legislature and the administration are still committed to the goal of 2050 being 100% renewable. So she attached it to the supplemental. I've heard people say they thought that was sneaky. I have to tell you, I don't think that's sneaky. That's just another way to get something through in terms of legislation. And I'm speaking to you as your rep, there've been a couple of my bills that the governor picked up and attached to the budget this year, and they got through that way. So I was grateful when she did it. Like for example, we had one bill, um, Gender X, allowing for non-binary gender option on state applications. She plucked that up and she attached it to the budget. It's just a way of trying to make sure that as vehicles are going through the legislative process, trying to hook your priorities onto different ones. But I know people are concerned because it may mean that that will go through. And some people have expressed to me their concern that it hasn't gotten enough um, discussion. What I can tell you is the parts that she has plucked from these bills were actually subject to not only public hearings, but they passed the House. So there was subject to amendments and discussion. I personally tried to amend the climate bill with about seven to eight amendments, some of which were about municipal control over um, siting, and some of which were about making sure that there was assessment of environmental and human health attached to solar siting and other kinds of things. Those amendments, when we discussed them in the House, were unsuccessful, but the bill went through. So she basically took from the bill that had gone through. All I can tell you about this right now, and I'm happy to discuss it with people at any point, is my office right now is trying to do, is doing an analysis to look at what the governor put in the supplemental compared to what the House passed to see what's the overlap and what's not. Since I already voted on one bill, I need to, to know What's, or what's being proposed that I already supported. I may change my mind, but I at least should know that. So right now my office is doing that analysis. Um, I'm happy to share what we learned from that. And we're also listening to constituents. Many of you have written, continue to write, tell me your concerns. Um, some constituents are saying they don't want the solar siting piece in the supplemental because they want a much bigger climate bill. Other constituents are saying, we just don't want the solar siting. We don't care about the other pieces that were in the climate bill. And some people are writing saying, we need more solar past the solar siting. So bring it on. You know what I'm saying? This is my job is to listen to my constituents and try to make the best decision that I can make. Um, I guess I, um, Lynn asked me to also talk about what I think may be on the horizon for the next session, which starts in January. As many of you know, November 5th is a big election. I hope everyone's registered to vote. 
make a plan. Um, that means like how you're gonna vote, where you're gonna vote, when you're gonna vote. If you're voting by mail, vote as early as possible. I don't know what the postal service capacity is going to be deluged with all these ballots. If you have people in your family who are students in other states, particularly if they're swing states, I would encourage them to make sure they're registered there um, and vote there. Massachusetts is not a swing state. So, um, and if you need help figuring out what that means, please get in touch with me and I'll give you link is, links and other kinds of things and deadlines that they may need to know about. Um, but so November 5th, I'm very grateful to the support for the district, to my district. Um, we'll see all the elected officials, the state Senate, state rep, um, U.S. Senator, U.S. Congressman, President, Vice President, Clerk of the Courts, a whole roster of folks. And the new session at the state level will start January 1st. And I think it is January 1st because I think that's the first Wednesday it is. in 2025. Um, and that's when we'll take our office. And that's also when bills will start to be developed and filed. So that also means that if you have an idea for a bill, if you think a bill is bad, you think we need to correct it, you should be letting me know now through the end of the year, because then in January, we'll start to file bills. Um, and we'll get to see what the priorities are from the members at that time. I know what hasn't passed this year that we need to do next year, but I'm not sh sure I can mention a few things that I think are going to be on the horizon. School funding is going to be a big issue in the budget. So we've got the budget, we've got legislation, but in the budget, we're gonna be looking at school funding. We're gonna be looking at the way we fund districts like Amherst, the way we reimburse for charter schools that disadvantage districts like Amherst. Um, and we're also gonna be looking at how we fund public higher education and early education, childcare. Um, as you know, we have the fair share amendment. This year, I think it generated about $2 billion. Um, that has to be spent on education and, trans and public transportation. So, but not necessarily for school districts, unless it's for special things in school districts, which it might be for minimum eight. But we'll, we're working hopefully with the school committee and the town council around that. And I see a member of the school committee who's here tonight. Thank you for coming. Um, housing will continue to be an issue. I don't want people to think, okay, we did 5.1 billion for housing production, we're done. We're not done. We're gonna see what interest rates are doing with housing. We're gonna see how that bond gets implemented. There are still people who need help with rent and to ward off foreclosure, and there's still people who are homeless. So those issues are gonna continue into the next um, session. Climate is going to continue. Even if we address these pieces in this informal session, I guarantee every year for a while, we're gonna have a climate bill because we're not done. The climate, every year we, you know, we don't, there's something that falls through the cracks that we have to address or we have to continue to expand and increase. We have to get our grid ready to accept all this renewable energy. We have to do more with EV vehicles and infrastructure. We have to figure out this solar siting. So there's gonna be more. We're going to be continuing to address it. Not, and that doesn't even talk about bottle, um, bottle deposits, plastic bag bans, and all those issues that sort of circle the climate that aren't specific to the climate. Um, I think we're gonna do more around public health support, or we should be doing more around public health support. And that's going to be around supporting the Department of Public Health to get more involved. Issues around long COVID. We're, let's see what happens with bird flu this winter. Um, I just think we're gonna be paying more attention to public health um, again, as we maybe not quite 2020 because we don't have a worldwide pandemic, but there'll be other issues. And I hope we'll do more with farms and food. So the other thing that's coming up, and I don't know if I'm eating up too much of your time, so you should tell me when to, um, is North, um, East, West, West, East rail. So um, there's two routes Lynn and Pat are very familiar with this. Um, there are two routes that are under consideration. One's called the Southern Route, that's Boston, Worcester, then extend it to Springfield and Pittsfield. There's also a Northern Tier Route, and that extends the train that goes to Fitchburg and brings it to Greenfield and North Adams. So many of you have heard me say this. Some people have said to me, so what does Amherst want? Which route is best for Amherst? 
And I say, the route that goes first is the best route <laughs> for Amherst, because it just so happens That's either good. route is fine That's for good. us. We're like smack in the middle of, yeah. if we wanted to get to Boston, it's equidistant for us to go to Springfield or Greenfield. And in fact, Greenfield might have some benefits when it comes to parking and other kinds of things. So whichever route goes first, and I want both routes to move. So the Northern tier is in a process of a public comment period and public comments are being accepted until I think October 10th is the date. Yeah. Um, and all public comments are welcome. So if you want to submit a comment, please get in touch with me. It's also on my social media. I'm happy to send the link as well as links to reports. Um, if you know someone who's commuting to Boston for work, we have a lot of people in our community who commute to Boston, let them know that this is coming up. They may not know, or there may be people who do business with people in Boston. They don't commute, but they maybe are consultants. And so every once in a while they have to go in and they would like to have a um, rail. This is the time to start talk, speaking up about the Northern tier. So that will continue into the next year as well. I do think that depending on what happens in the November election, um, some of that, uh, some of the, the results will dictate some of our agenda at the legislature. So for example, um, these are some of the issues that come to my mind as either being protected or under assault, depending on who's elected. Reproductive rights, LGBTQ rights, access to health care protection for our immigrant communities and neighbors, higher education writ large, not just public higher education. Look at what the Supreme Court decision has done to like Amherst College freshman class, okay? Um, and equity. And that's last piece, notwithstanding who gets elected. I wanna assure you that one thing that I do with my colleagues from Western Massachusetts is we lock arms all the time and fight for regional equity. And I expect there's going to be a lot of reasons to do that in the next session when it comes to money coming back to Western Massachusetts, services coming back to Western Massachusetts and services starting in Western Massachusetts. So we'll be fighting those fights. I think I'll take a break. Okay, so sure. if you are on Zoom and you would like to ask a question of Mindy, please raise your hand. If you're in the audience here in the room with us and you would like to ask a question of Mindy, please raise your hand. So Lori, I'm going to ask you to unmute and go ahead. Um, okay, thanks, Mindy. Um, there's a lot here, um, and I think people are going to be surprised because I'm not going to ask about the climate bill. I'm going to ask about the thing that did pass that I was surprised and happily surprised to see. Um, I want to know a little bit more about the long-term care facilities bill that was passed, and two specific questions. One, does it finally allow basically as much nursing care as is needed in a, in a uh, assisted living facility, and does it change the Medicaid landscape in uh, Massachusetts? I'm asking for very personal reasons. I have a mother who I put in a assisted living facility in New Jersey because it would have been impossible to do it here because she needs to be on Medicaid, and Medicaid won't pay for that in the state, but it does in New Jersey. Will that change with this bill? So I think what I want the I think the way I want to answer that, Lori, tonight is well. First of all, I want us to be in touch about this even tomorrow. Okay, like cool. specifically. I want to send you information on the bill. Excellent. What it does and what it doesn't do. It was mostly done as a bill that would try to make sure that we were supporting the workforce in the long-term care facility world because mm. COVID really decimated the workforce and then shrunk the availability of services. So it looks at workforce and it also looks at enforcement for abuses. In terms of Medicaid, I'm not sure, okay. but because you have a personal situation that might be affected by that. I'd like to actually handle that as casework and maybe advocate for you separately and see how that goes within the house. So would you mind being in touch with me about that? No, maybe, in the, maybe in the chat, we can put my email. And I, I have your email, Mindy, don't worry about it. <laughs> would that be all right? Would that be okay to be in yeah, touch? Yeah, that's with fine. You? I will okay. send you an email. Thank you. And then I can send you the information on the bill and we can also talk about your personal situation. All right, thanks. Thank you. Okay, are there other questions for Mindy? Yes, Renee. 
please state your name. Yeah. She's Berry Road. <laughs> I completely. So I personally would hope that our legislators in this net would not would not be supported unless we address. Well, so let me just correct a couple, a couple pieces of information in the beginning, because um, I was a fault. If, if I want to clarify what I was saying, um, the solar siting. It's not that the governor picked out at things that everybody agreed to. She picked out things that passed the House version of the bill that were her priorities. They weren't necessarily things that everybody agreed to, um, but they definitely were her priorities and they were known to be her priorities from the beginning of the session. That that's what she has wanted to do is discuss and deal with the solar siting. I agree with you in terms of regional equity and the way um, solar siting looks like it's being shaped. I've talked with the Secretary of Energy and Environment Affairs about this at length, about how our region is a region that's already dealt with our natural resources being stripped and sent to the eastern part of the state. Um, and that the history and the legacy of the Quabbin is something that we're all very much aware of. And that this does feel very familiar because even though it's not water, it's the same, it, it pretty much is the same kind of thing. But I have to tell you, based on what I've seen, unfortunately, rooftops and parking lots alone are not gonna do the trick. And I think this is the dilemma. I'm not siding one way or the other in this, but um, when, because I agree with that, we should have those as priorities. I'm on several bills and supported several amendments that would have pushed that to be first. Um, as you know, both Senator Comerford and Rep. Lay also have bills around this and I'm the co-filer on both of those. Um, but when they did that, when they present how much energy we, how much electricity we need by 2050 and renewable, how much we have right now, how much we would get from parking lots and rooftops. This isn't a reason not to do them first, by the way. This is just calculations. We're still behind. We still need a raise. So I think the dilemma for the environmental and, and energy, to tell you the truth, and the secretary is how to get there. Um, I don't think that's an excuse not to do parking lots and rooftops first. You know what I mean? Like some people say, that's not enough. So mm -hmm. we shouldn't, we should do that last and just go and strip the, you know, bigger, do a big array because that's going to take too long. I don't think that's the case. I think we should do the built environment first and then proceed. Um, I don't know if we're going to be successful, but I'm, you know, I want you to know that we're waging that fight. And when I say Western Mass in that situation, I can't speak for all the, legislators in Western Mass in terms of this particular thing, because remember, it's not just Franklin and Hampshire County, it's also Springfield. They have other issues regarding making sure that like, you know, 
biomass doesn't get done. And we're certainly supporting that, not only because I don't want them to, their health to be endangered, but we live in a valley. So it's coming, it, it's not just them, it's also us, and it's also the Berkshires. So, um, you know, but I think Hampshire and Franklin are particularly um, feeling the, the pinch of the forest, even more so than the Berkshires uh, at this point. But thank you, I appreciate that. And I can tell you that we're, we're talking the same language when we talk to the administration about this. I still think, you know, please continue to say it and bring it to me. Um, but I just want you to be assured that we know. Okay. Yes, go ahead. Eric, please state your name. I'll be back to the Zoom in a moment. Go ahead. Well, I think the, the instinct is to go big, I think. And, and unfortunately, that's on for us right now, right? Well, I don't know. I can't speak to whether or not it's stalled because I don't know. I know that in some cases, I've we've been involved with constituents who have wanted to put solar, and there's been a delay because you know they can't get a transformer, right? Because our grid actually isn't up to the up to what it has to be to start accepting solar. So they're like stymied in terms of being able to do that. I know that not every roof is eligible for solar. You know, my house isn't eligible for solar unless you want me to clear cut the trees around my house so that I can get the sun, which I'm not gonna do. Um, so, you know, but so, and I think, you know, there is a great deal of investment that needs to be put in, right? Public investment in terms of the built environment, I think. So that's where you're gonna see a lot of us start to sort of really advocate is not just, we want it to be a priority, but we wanna start at making sure that there's a public investment in it. Um, but I'm not sure if it's, I mean, I haven't heard of um, sort of mass uh, stall, stalling of solar, but I'd be interested in having more information on that. No, I got it.
Yeah, I'd love it on every parking lot in New England. So if you I'm, think about all the plowing okay. you'd say. I'm, I am going to go to the people in Zoom. So Becca Thank Watkins, uh, go ahead and unmute and go ahead with your question. Hi, Mindy. I, I appreciate you being here tonight. Uh, my name is Becca Watkins. Um, I was calling in to ask how we can go about uh, reducing speed limits on our neighborhood streets. Um, I have tried at the town level and it seems as though it's very difficult for us to change the speed limits without doing traffic and engineering studies, which is just more of a money burden on our town. Um, currently, many of our neighborhood streets are set at 30 miles per hour. Um, and many of us do not have sidewalks, but even if we did, I think it's still too high. Um, the state's website directs us to the NACTO website, which advocates for speed limits set at 25 miles per hour and 20 miles per hour on minor roads because of the 50% fatality rate of speed limits set at 30 miles per hour. So my question to you is, I'm wondering if you have any insight for us about how we can go about changing our neighborhood speed limits to be lower and safer for the pedestrians that use them. Um, because it just doesn't seem right to make a town spend money on a, on a traffic study to lower a neighborhood street. And, and I'm just gonna, we actually have embraced the 25 mile an hour oh, in yes, Amherst. And I but. Thank you, Lynn. And I appreciate that. And I meant to add, but that does not count for streets that are already posted. It, so, and in addition, it is the state that requires the study. Yes, the state. So that is something that we should explore more with Mindy sure. and see what we can do about changing the requirement at the state level, because it yes. is a hefty requirement with a lot of cost. Yes. This is the first I've heard of it, Becca, and I'm happy to work with the town on it. Oh, I very much appreciate so it. Stay tuned and, okay. you know, nudge me, which means. Okay. Oh, I know, will. Lynn knows. I'll nudge what's you. What's going on with it? <laughs> yes, I will. Thank, Thank you. Dion and Chris, I'm going to allow you to talk. Please state your name. You have to unmute. Dion, yes, there you go. There we go. Hold on. Hold on. We have been, we've been, can you hear me, Lynn? We can. I can't hear you now. Now you have to turn, turn, uh... oh dear. Sorry. They're right down there. That's where this was. You, you one of you I'm needs to speak you, into the mic. The, then it makes okay. it there, see? Then you have to move that thing. Okay. How about that? We can hear you. Hear okay. Well, thank you. I'm sorry. Um, uh, I just want to thank you for doing this, Lynn and, and Mindy. And uh, it's um, it's been very interesting. I'm, I'm very interested in the climate progress that didn't get didn't get made. <laughs> uh, hope we hope we still could finally pull something out of the hat there. Uh, mostly, I just want to say that I haven't been able to hear the many of the comments. I couldn't hear Mindy very well at all, and um, and as some and the people people that were speaking from I guess it must be from town hall. Um, I couldn't hear at all. We couldn't hear. At all. I could hear Mindy pretty well, but the people asking the questions, I could not hear. Okay, um, thank you. We will ask people that are going to ask questions that are here. I'll get a mic and we'll walk around, okay? That would be great. That'd be great. Thank okay. you. Um, thank you. So that's all I have to say. Just thank you very much. Thanks. So just to let you know, the question before the, your call was about speed limits in Amherst and that lowering them requires state, um, state requirement of a traffic study. And the question was, could Amherst, could we figure out a way for Amherst not to have to go through that to be able to lower the mileage? And I said, let's find out. So we're going to work on that. Thank you, Deanne and Chris. Okay. Oh. 
Oh. Yeah, it's back here. So we have a mic, which Pat is going to it, take the one that Oops. is green. <laughs> Can you speak into that and tell me if it's working? Here, hold on. Our technology person. We'll repeat Hello. the question, I think. We, we're just going to just repeat the question. Hello? There you go. do it all night because you're the youngest person here. Sure. I'll take that. Um, my question was for Mindy about the uh, climate bill. So the polluter, I remember we worked with you on a polluter pay bill a little while ago, and I was wondering, is that included in the climate bill? Has that made any progress? And if not, sort of where is there some sort of equity to say, hey, if you're polluting Massachusetts, both from a carbon emissions perspective and the like um, waters, air, et cetera, what sort of responsibility do you have as a corporation? I don't remember if it was in the house bill, Julian. I think I'm gonna have to get back to you on that. I can guarantee you though, if it doesn't cross the finish line this session, it will likely be refiled in January. I think, was it Rep. Steve Owens who did that bill? Do you remember? Yes. Is that yep, who it was? Sure, yeah. um, and uh, he's also um, sort of a maven when it comes to electric vehicles and you know electric transportation. So I don't think he's going to let go of that one. And I think it'll come back and then we'll continue to fight. You know, I know that people feel the legislation is very slow in Massachusetts. I, I don't feel that way all the time. And with climate, I do feel like there's going to be a bill every year, at least one. So there's going to be lots of opportunities to do that. Um, keep in mind, the other bill that we did pass earlier in the session was around supporting the wind industry. So it's not like we're only looking at solar. We're also looking at wind. Um, but uh, this bill had a lot of a lot of pieces in it that were not in mutual agreement between the House and the Senate, which is why it stalled. And there was an economic development bill that passed like over the summer um, that had a million dollars for solar in uh, Amherst public parking lots. Um, that I going... don't think that was the economic development. That, that was, one? it's in the economic development bill that passed the house and there's one that passed the Senate, but it has not passed the legislature. Got it. It's still That's in conference. Point. And there you go. Quite frankly, that is a bill that needs to come out for that reason, as well as there's a whole section in that bill on climate tech jobs. And there's also several amendments in there that I got for um, uh, Amherst that I'd like to see come out. So. Okay. Uh, we're, on, we're going to keep Mindy going for no longer than 7.30. I have one more question and I wanna make sure that it's for Mindy and not just general comment. Uh, and then there was somebody else in the room. Yes. Our freshman from UMass is going to help you. us. Thank um, you. I'm actually taking the microphone so I can pass it back to the two people who weren't heard by the 20. Oh, that's people. a good idea. Could we do that? Sure. Yeah. Okay. If they're up for it. Okay. Um, my name is Renee Moss. And um, what did I say? Um, I was uh, commenting, what? Yeah, right. I picked up on Vindy's regional equity. And um, I asked about that in relation to deforestation and um, farmland as being an issue of regional equity. And if we're going to do deforestation to, to build large industrial sized solar arrays, um, you know, what are we doing to Western Massachusetts? And, you know, I hearkened back to uh, the Quabbin and what happened there. And as long as I have the microphone, the other thing about the bill is that it, the, the whole issue of taking away control, municipal 
the control of municipalities to permit or not permit uh, projects coming before them. And I think that is a real horrendous piece of this climate bill that, and, and a real issue around regionalization um, that's in the supplemental budget. That piece stayed in it to take, to take the ability to regulate solar on a municipal level. So and it's not something else in. Was there, was there anything, just very briefly, Eric, yeah. you want to go ahead and, and stick to what you said? Just, just yeah. Yeah, I'll try to keep it brief. Uh, Eric Backrack, Shoots Ferry Road. Um, my uh, concern is that study after study has identified uh, many um, uh, uh, that, that the built environment will not provide enough energy and we have to look at large scale def deforestation for industrial solar and my my perception is 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 that um there is no effort to at least begin on the built environment that it's it's more rhetoric and just science studies and and uh, i think there there's plenty of opportunity there and i hope that that would be um, first and foremost, and we, when we run out of the built environment as uh, eminently good places for solar, then let's look at the forests once, we did, once we've expanded, ex ex expended that uh, opportunity, those opportunities. Thank you. So uh, Arlie, you're in the audience. You have your hand up. And I assume this is something for Mindy. Um, hi. Um, this is... You need to speak into the mic, Arlie. Oh, hi. This is Arlie Gould. I um, I was at the UMass Clean Extension presentation by uh, Mr. Judge, and um, and then Mindy also said something that reminded me. You know, this meeting the energy needs. Um, it seems there's a lot of talk about you know we've got to ramp up, we've got to ramp up, and yes, we do. But I'm not hearing, and this was at that clean, you know, extension thing. People were saying this as well. Anything about reducing our own energy uses that doesn't seem to be very much in the conversation. Um, I was, you know, I'm glad to hear about the train stuff, you know, that's coming because this uh, person you were mentioning, you know, who's into electric vehicles, it's like, we're all going to just go from gas to electric cars and, you know, mass transportation. And, um, and one thing is AI and Bitcoin, very um, sucking of energy. Uh, and uh, I saw something that said, if they were a country, they'd be the 12th largest user of electricity in the world. So just this kind of conversation around um, this whole um, need. Also, solar, I think we have to think of it, I think, somewhat as a transition energy. We've got to be careful about getting overinvested at this moment in this particular uh, quote unquote clean energy. Um, because I read in um, the latest, you know, I'm in a UMass alumna magazine. Scientists there have discovered how to make electricity from humidity. Now, this is nowhere near at, you know, scale for powering everything, but this is going to be possibly. And then I just read an article. Now, this is the U.S. government and this is nuclear, which is, but they're starting to take um, nuclear warheads and getting the uranium out of that for second generation nuclear reactors, which are hopefully safer, but those take up much less space and they don't emit and they have other issues. But I'm just saying, you know, solar takes up so much land if we want to get it to scale, to power things that um, I don't think it's going to last. And my last thing, uh, Harvard, you know, magazine, The Dark Side of Solar, you know, in 20, 30 years, the the trash, the garbage of the spent. Did we lose you? Arlie, did we lose you? Sorry. Arlie, Hi. You, Hi. You, please finish up. You need to. Oh, yep. And I'm just saying, you know, 
and I agree with the previous speakers, built environment first and everything. And um, just that we're, we're looking at a lot of uh, garbage coming from these huge solar arrays. Thank you. Thank you for um, calling in. So I totally agree that we need to start, or not start, we need to really emphasize personal use and reduction of use of electricity. We haven't been so successful with that, but we really need to sort of put our nose to the grindstone or whatever that expression is and figure out how we can incentivize and support people to change their behavior so that they reduce their energy use. I have a little bit of experience around behavior change, but from the public health perspective, it's not easy to do. So, but it is something that has to be a component of our climate response. In terms of solar creating trash, particularly panels, um, my office, as well as another office for a legislator, we're exploring legislation around um, the recycling of uh, solar panels and what that involves and what that could mean and why that would be important. So um, not just me, but I think other people are also looking at, okay, so what happens literally downstream from this situation? And yes, AI takes up a lot of fossil fuel and a lot of, um, I think it's the equivalent of like thousands of plastic uh, non-recyclable bottles. Um, and so we're behind on regulating AI in Massachusetts, but that's probably something that we'll see tick up in the next session. Mindy, thank you so much. This is so special to have you come and join us. Thank um, you. We have 23 people in on Zoom and we have all of us here in the room. So we hope it's worth your while. And uh, we look forward to working with you on the many things that you've listed going forward in next year. Okay? Thank you. I look forward to working with everybody. And I look forward as the state rep also to look to sort of watch with all of you the construction of the new school and seeing state resources go into that and make sure that every penny comes to Amherst that's supposed to come. I'm gonna stick around for a little bit in case there's more comments on solar. Great. Okay, thank you. Okay, Andy. Yeah, I just have one real quick thing. There was a question earlier about speed limits. I wrote a fairly comprehensive report for the council in my role as chair of the town services committee about how speed limits are set and what the barriers are and I will send a copy to Mindy and um, anybody who is interested in that report that I gave to the council earlier this year, um, just send me an email to steinbergA at amherstma.gov. And when Andy gives that to me, I'll make sure we send it out to everybody on our list, okay? Um, so on our agenda tonight, we actually wanna talk about a couple of things that are present on the council's agenda right now. The first one we're gonna talk about is the waste proposed waste hauler bylaw. So just, just give me a moment. I'm going to pull up a slide. And um, Can those of you on Zoom see the slide? Lori? Yes, we, yes, we can see it. Um, I'd also ask if you could, is there some way these slides could be posted somewhere? I'll, I'll send it out on my um, email list, okay? Great, thank you, Lynn. Absolutely. Um, hold on. So. It is a slideshow, hold on. All right, we're seeing the slides not in slideshow present mode, as I think you know. Okay, all right. So we have the waste hauler. This is presently being discussed in the Town Services and Outreach Committee. The council has voted to go ahead and continue to explore this uh, with an RFP that gives us some sense of the cost. But we want to use the opportunity tonight 
<coughs> with Andy Steinberg here, who is chair of that committee, uh, to answer questions you may have and hear comments. So we as a uh, town have actually been a leader in environmental waste management for a long time. You can see up here the various things that we have done. So right now we have a system and it's a system that um, we have been able to, I'm sorry, I went too fast. It's a system that we've been able to manage over time and it, but why do we want to change it? Well, because there are still issues about landfills, the lack of landfills, the issue of methane and greenhouse gases, and the whole issue of mis municipal waste in, of, in or, of organic material and food waste. Um, I need to just have this. Yeah, okay, now I can go from the beginning. Okay, from the beginning, we'll try it again. Um, there are three key elements to our existing system. One is we have a town to the proposed revisions. I'm sorry, three key, three key elements. And that is the town would contract. We would not become waste haulers ourselves, but we would have a contracted system. We would have a robust pay as you throw fee system and it would include curbside compound posting. We have not made the decision to move on this yet. We're still collecting thoughts. Our current system is we all contract our, on our own. We have a ha license, haulers are licensed by our board of health, our health department. And mostly for those of us living in individual residents, US Waste is the primary provider of household hauling. They provide weekly pickup of trash, bi-weekly bi pickup of recyclables, and you can contract with them for composting. And as we look at this, you can also go to the transfer station. You can take your trash here, their composting, your recyclables. You can take other household trash and food composting, which is free. You can take electrics and bulk, bulk waste items and so forth. Um, and on a periodic basis, the DPW does do curbside pickup of leaves, sometimes Christmas trees, that kind of thing. So the town motion is one that is fairly complex in that we have advised the town manager to issue an RFP in accordance with the goals below. And this is in order for us to decide whether or not we want to move forward with a bylaw. The town would negotiate and contract with a waste hauler or haulers on behalf of residents for collection of house trash, unlimited recyclables and compostables. The contract would include pay as you throw. Curbside side composting would be made available to all residents. The transfer station would, would be remain open, but it's not completely clear what role it would play in the waste management program. But we it is an, actually a legal requirement that we provide the transfer station. Programs would be phased in beginning with single family and then two, three, and four unit properties, and eventually expanding to all residential properties. Haulers would have to provide an annual report to the town on the weight in tons and trash and recyclables and compostables. And let me just move this. An advantage in awarding a contract would be given to haulers who dispose of their material locally. So they're not adding additional uh, costs by transporting at great distance, as well as um, additional climate because of driving the car, driving. So, but we need to take a number of steps. And 
there's a lot of questions and we're collecting questions. First of all, what will be the cost to the consumer? What will be the cost to the town? How will we pay as you, will the, how will the pay as the road you throw system be structured? How will we enforce this? Who will handle complaints and customer service? What additional services will be available such as bulk? Will there be exemptions? And if so, what would they be? How do we get input from the community about what we're considering? That's one of the reasons why we're doing a, a council, a uh, district meeting and district one did one last week and the other districts are getting ready to schedule theirs as well. How do we phase in the large residential complexes, including condominiums? How do we make curbside composting available to all residents? One of the interesting questions that's been raised here, what if I can't haul my composting down to the thing? How will I get it down my driveway? That kind of thing. Should the bylaw include small businesses? What will be the role of the transfer station? And how can the town lead by example and become a model? So we have a current bylaw, but what we really want to do is now spend some time asking you if you have questions about this at this time. And Andy is here with us with the opportunity to answer those questions. And we'll see what, we also are keeping a running log of them. So we want to make sure that um, we are compiling them all together. So if you are on Zoom and you would like to ask a question, raise your hand. And if you're in the audience here in the town room, raise your hand. I'm going to call in over here. Who's got the mic? Carol, thank you. Hi, Kathleen Bridgewater, Shootsburg Road. I, I didn't see on the list any mention of the universities or... Yeah. And I'm going to repeat the questions because we're still having audience on Zoom. Hello? Yeah, okay. go ahead. Uh, okay, we're good. Um, I didn't see any mention of the universities, how, how the waste from the universities gets... Is it is it a parallel program, or are they considered somewhat involved with what we would do as a town? What would the cost be that would be uh, placed on the university as they continue to have more and more um, off-campus housing all around the town? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that. I think that that should be part of the picture as well. Okay. Let me just mention the university, uh, having been an employee at the university for over 30 years, actually, they're pretty robust on their recycling. It's, uh, they leave you little notes if they find things in the trash that should be recycled. Uh, so it's their, their custodians are trained to actually promote this. Uh, this, this bylaw would not cover them, okay? But when you bring up residents that are living in town, eventually it would cover those residents as well. Right. My, my question is, do we end up as a town subsidizing their process of waste no. Uh, removal? No, they, in any they, way, shape or form. They pay for their own hauling. They pay for their own composting. They are so totally self-sufficient, as is Amherst College and Hampshire College. Um, Lori Goldner, you have your hand up. I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Yep, yep. thanks. Um, so first, I, I think it's great that the town is considering this. I'm, I'm very happy to hear it as a, uh, as a resident. Um, I do wonder, I didn't realize that USA will actually do curbside composting. I shudder to think what it might cost considering that all of our fees pretty much doubled when, all, when they bought up all the local trucking uh, businesses um, some years ago now. Um, but how do we know? So I, I like that in this proposal is the idea that uh, local composting would be prioritized. In general, how do we know that the composting is really being composted and the recycling is really being recycled when we're always reading that, oh, only 6% of plastics that go into recycle bins ever actually get recycled. Um, what guarantees are there currently and in this bill? How do they, do they, would they differ at all? 
Those are good questions. Andy, do you have anything you want to say about that? Yes. Um, the requ requirements um, are going to be stated in the request for proposals, and uh, we would insist on having uh, both a plan put forward that would ex um, explain how they're meeting the requirements that uh, we have put forward and uh, we are looking to have our own monitoring system. One of the things of having a town contract is the ability to uh, in enforce what is happening. And town has a lot of experience with uh, recycling because of what it does through the transfer station. Uh, I am not too concerned about either one of those items because uh, the um, waste haulers, uh, for the most part, either use the um, what's called the uh, the MRF, the Materials Recycling Facility, in Springfield, and or they um, have their own USA Waste has their own system, but um, I think that we are. Um, assert, we're certain that they are doing what they're uh, supposed to be doing with recycling. The big challenge with recycling for everybody is that uh, the market changes regularly and uh, the um, amount that we receive for our recycle, uh, we used to get, um, it used to make money off of getting rid of recycle. Um, yeah. That's not necessarily true anymore, and that's uh, one of the big challenges, one of the reasons that um, this is an industry that is in flux and causing uh, uh, costs to go up. Um, there's a uh, uh, several, uh, the, all of this is regulated by um, the, the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection, DEP. Um, has um, a set of uh, places where uh, compost is accepted and uh, the, um, we would be looking to make sure that they're using a facility off of the list. USA Waste is now using Martin's Farms, which is actually a very good facility in Greenfield and uh, is providing uh, high quality recycling um, and uh, of, of uh, compost material. Um, okay, I'm going to go on to the next one. Jeff Blaustein, uh, Hi, you're unmuted, so go ahead. Hi, thank you. It's Jeff in Maryland. Uh, we bring our waste to the transfer station probably once a month, maybe once every five weeks. We probably pay about $150 a year for, for, um, for our total trash collection um, disposal. Uh, we bring our, a lot of our compost that we can't compost in our yard up there. How is it going to affect people who are paying like $150, people that are, that are hauling their own trash to the transfer station? Right now, that is a priority of the process that we're underway uh, to uh, make sure that uh, we can try and maintain that facility. And uh, you have to remember that this is right now something that is under study, uh, we're, uh, the council is gonna have to make a decision at the end of a yes or no to the new system. And there will be a series of questions that are going to have to be answered correctly before we say yes. And the ability of having the alternative system um, is, I predict, gonna be high on the list of things that the council will consider. Thank you. Uh, I'm going a thump, thump, thumpton, excuse me for mispronouncing your name, but please unmute and go ahead. Hi, the name is Tupton, um, but this is her husband. This is Jason Dorney, 5 Hickory Lane. Um, I just wanted to ask, this is a little bit of a tangent, but with all the talk about waste and solar and energy, has anybody at the state or anywhere discussed waste to energy 
So we're not having to potentially find places to bury all of this trash, but rather utilizing it as an energy source. Um, that's down the road and part of the yeah, uh, what would be in the RFP is how are you going to use this and um, but that's a good question. Yeah, uh, and that that is actually a good question too that I'm glad you uh, brought up mm -hmm. um, because the there this DEP does have um, licensed combustion facilities and uh, you've raised a question that I have very much thought about and that is when they do have the combustion facilities are they generating energy from that uh, we don't have an answer to that yet uh, but uh, actually that's a part of the current system of uh, uh, the uh, disposal of trash um, I'm going to say something really quick, even though Lynn doesn't want me to go on for long, and I won't. Uh, what that third slide said is that there were several things that are reasons for doing this that are environmental, and uh, it's very much a part of what we care about, and what is driving this. Um, and one is that landfills are pretty much filled in Massachusetts. There is no more landfill capacity. We're very close to the last one in the entire state being closed. And uh, so except for combustion facilities, most of the trash that we're generating that has to go into trash cans um, ends up going out of state and some at a great distance. There is an environmental cost to that in shipping um, trash just to be disposed of. And uh, so that anything we can do to reduce the amount of trash has an environmental effect. Uh, the other thing is, is that um, compost is something that you don't have to ship out um, because it can be used to uh, generate high quality uh, product soil to use in farming and in home use. Um, the other thing that uh, a lot of people are not aware of is that when you uh, bury trash, it generates methane and methane leaks into the environment. That's a greenhouse gas. Okay, there's a question here in the town room. Um, can you get the mic? Thank you, whoever has it. Thanks, Mike. Michael. And please let just, us know who you are and see if I think it's you on. You just need to hold it up. Then no. you probably turned it off. Hello? No. It's on. Okay, the light is green. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay. 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 Patricia Applebaum. <clears throat> um, I'm glad to see the town um, considering this whole system. I just have several um, questions and suggestions as we move forward, and I may need my memory refreshed on some of them. Um, first of all, with the pay as you throw system that's been suggested, um, I would like to urge that that be uh, charged by the bag. I read at, at least one point there was um, a proposal to make the pay as you throw by trash container. Mm -hmm. I am a single senior. I recycle. I have access to home composting. I generate maybe one bag of trash, trash every two weeks. And if I'm charged by container, I am way overcharged. So please keep that in mind, charged by the bag and not by container. Thank you. Second, I would love to see a hazardous waste collection more than once a year, because if you miss that one, you know, you've missed it, you're done. Or you can drive in your personal car to Westfield and pay a private company to dispose of it. And those are the only options. So more than once a year would be a good idea. And finally, I would suggest, I'd like to see us consider lowering the cost for station per. I have never lived in a municipality where access to the transfer station cost $125. Um, not all of us use it for all of our trash disposal. Many of us would like to use it, say, once every three or four months when you, you clean out the basement or you have a large object to dispose of and so or so something like that. 
and $125 is not reasonable for that kind of usage, but it's that or else the alternative is no access at all. So I would like to see us go to something like a much more moderately priced town permit and then possibly pay as you throw when you go to the transfer station. So those are my three thoughts, thank you. Thank you for sharing those. And uh, Andy is recording them and keeping what we're hearing at all of these different meetings. Uh, Lori, you still have your hand up. I'll go ahead and unmute you. Yeah, yeah, I wanted to um, say something about the burning trash. Um, so this is now as, as chairman of the chair of the Energy and Climate Action Committee, um, the town I wanted to remind folks does have a climate action and adaptation plan, resilient and resilience plan, the CARP, which calls specifically for changes in waste management along these lines. Um, especially composting is an enormous boon to the reduction of greenhouse gases and to carbon sequestration both. Burning trash is not in the CARP because it is a seriously bad idea in the same vein with so-called biofuels, which basically boils down to burning forests. Um, both of those create greenhouse gas. Yes, in the long run, it's a renewable energy, but we don't have 100 years to regrow a forest or to regenerate trash piles, or, you know, it doesn't work that way right now. We have to stop burning stuff. So um, just wanted to throw that out there, what's in the carp, what's not in the carp, and why. Um, I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, yes, Eric. Thanks, Lynn. Uh, just one quick uh, observation. I think, first of all, it's a, a great, great leap forward for the town to be embarking on studying it and considering it very seriously. What I'm concerned about when one of the last slides was presented that it said we're not really sure how we're dealing with small businesses, and I suspect that's code for restaurants. Mm -hmm. And restaurants, I would think, uh, produce an enormous amount of waste and compost. So I would really move that up on the priority list because I can't imagine the amount of compost that could be created on a daily basis by small business. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Uh, if there's no other questions on this, we're going to move on to the next item. And that is um, the nuisance property yeah. and Pat, I'm yeah, going to do slides. Yeah. Because there are a couple of things that I want to, I want to make sure that the solar conversation, I'm sorry. I want to make sure the solar conversation is finished. It got kind of blended into speaking with Mindy and that's fine. And I also see several people from school committee and schools and whether they're here for different issues besides the nuisance bylaw. And um, Renee? You need to, so, Pat, are you suggesting we go to other issues before yeah, we do Yeah, well, I just want to check because it, okay. it didn't feel like we finished the solar conversation, although I could be wrong. And I'm wondering very specifically why we have a school committee member, an educator uh, here. And I'm and they may just be here for other issues. I they, just want to check. They live in the district. You want to speak <laughs> that you have that opportunity. Yeah. You Sounds good, Liz. Absolutely. Sounds good. <laughs> Sounds good. And you used to be in district two, but then you had to move. We, we, we got redistricted. Renee, go ahead. Yes, I just had one more thing around the solar stuff. And um, it with, when Mindy was here, it was more state related. But for, for this, I was just curious as to where the solar bylaw is in terms of the council. OK. <laughs> Pat? Do you want to answer that or shall I? We have two other counselors here that are on that committee. One is the chair of CRC, and that's um, Pam Rooney, and the vice chair of CRC, which is Jennifer Taub. So, Pat, do you want to try my, it or my either one of you might want to raise your it, hands? It's still stuck in committee. It's in CRC. We are trying to gather information from town staff that's relevant to the bylaw. Uh, it's so that's all I'm going to say right now. But Pam Rooney and Jennifer Tauber are welcome if you'd like to add anything. 
And I can be more specific later if you need me to be. And Pam or Jennifer, if you want, if you have anything else you'd like to add at this point, please raise your hand. Okay. All right. Uh, let's go on to nuisance property. Okay. okay. Oh yes. Oh please go. Yes. Um, I, I sent an email yeah. to you concerning um, our interest in finding out what kinds of conversations are happening uh, among the, the staff and the people who are making the Shutesbury Road proposal. So that's, that's part so one. Part two would be um, the land has been, much of that land has been taken out of chapter 61 uh, agriculture or forest protection. And that means what? Uh, okay. Does that mean that the company and the landowner are changing their proposal from being the company is leasing that property for the duration of the, uh, the uh, large scale installation or is something else happening? Uh, is is and part A on that would be the town. If if something is going to be sold, the town has legal abilities to be the first to to um, make a proposal to buy that land if they wanted to. Right. And so the land is not for sale. The land has. How been, do we know that? Uh, so we've been at the town people have been in touch with the uh, owner of the land and we've also they've also been in touch with our attorney and if they're at this point it's not for sale it is um and the use of it is not changing and so although it is being put into the subdivision category so the use isn't changing and it's not for sale. So therefore there is no option to exercise our 61A option at this time. Does that? Well, we know that the, the idea that it's a subdivision is just a, a pretext. It isn't, nobody intends to make that into- That's accurate. Right. It, it's, it's a bizarre kind of thing that goes on Right. And uh, nobody involved in that project ever intends to put in a, pro a housing project. Mm -hmm. It is about playing games with the solar bylaw, um, I presume. One has to guess because the transparency isn't there. So, so just to be clear, the solar bylaw that we are working on does not impact that right. thing. You're, so, that's grandfathered through. Right. So, which makes us wonder, what is this all about? Yeah, so when I asked about that particular issue of the 61A property today, I was told that one, it's not for sale, and two, and because it's not for sale and its use is, pl they're planning to use it as they were planning to use it before, there is no 61A right of first refusal. That's what, uh, that's what our legal counsel has told us. And so, so I guess now I'll go back to the first part. Are people on staff having conversations that should be public conversations that um, concerning this proposal? That, the per, the, so at, that we as abutters, for example, yeah. and as our neighborhood yeah. can know what's going on and not just have it suddenly make a grand rush to, to get the proposal pushed through. The, the proposal, as you are aware, is in front of the ZBA. Those meetings are public. That is the conversation at this point, is whatever is going on with ZBA. If you have any other questions beyond that, you can always contact Dave Zomack, their town manager, and that's everything else is in front of ZBA. It's gonna be critical that the ZBA really um, look at issues uh, health and safety. Yes, absolutely. 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 That the area that is up for deforestation 
for this project, you know, if there's a lack of water to put out fires and things like that, we have issues around wells. Um, and so it, it really will be critical that the ZBA uh, have the courage to make a decision about the uh, 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 a final decision about whether to allow a special permit or to deny it. Um, it needs to be, you know, Peter Sham is a good town. Exactly. It's a very, very good example of how to move forward uh, with a land court approval or a land court uh, opposition to this kind of, pro this particular uh, project in Sh uh, off Shootsbury Road. And I want to say publicly, I am not opposed to large scale industrial solar in the right sites. And this is neither not are the we right site right. Um, for many, many reasons. Right. So, um, okay. And um, so if you, it, let me just say, I have taken the questions that both you and Renee have sent me. I've taken the questions that Michael made me aware of, and I have forwarded them to the town manager and I'm looking for the responses. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. That's the best I can do. <laughs> um, all right, do you want to go on to nuisance property? <laughs> All right. I was hoping to avoid it. Yeah, no, well, not really. you're not. Um, uh, hold on one second. Let me get the screen share up. Bridget, did you? Sorry, I... Absolutely. Oh, Mike. Thank you. So no, I don't have the great fortune yeah. of living in District Two anymore, yeah. <laughs> as Lynn pointed out. Uh, but I, I do have yeah. relatives who live in District Two. Well, but I, as no, a school committee there, member, I represent I the whole town, and I also office. have ones in three, oh. four, and five so now. So we've almost got the whole place. Don't worry about it. So, so but I, I just wanted to get to any sort of meetings that are happening. I, because I didn't have my keys, I couldn't lock the building. Uh, actually, and I also thought, no one I think it's the. Uh, I muted you. Thank you. Go ahead. <laughs> I just wanted to. Um, we had a um, four towns meeting on Saturday where the superintendent announced that we're looking at um, potentially $3.3 .3 million in cuts if we go along with the sort of proposal that came to us from town council. If we get a better fiscal situation, we still are facing a tremendous amount of cuts for the next school year budget, probably as much as 2.1. We're gonna be making budget decisions as a town in November. And so I just want as many people as possible to be aware early in the process because the budget priorities come up as soon as November for next fiscal yes, year. I do. Oh, sorry, y'all. Um, mainly, I'm Julian's mom, but I'm also Bridget Hines, and I serve on the school committee. And Julian brought me to this meeting to hear about the climate stuff from Indy. So, thanks. And she used to bring Julian to our meetings. He's been coming to our meetings since we started six years ago. Yeah. And he is now on the chair uh, charter review committee. So, um, and you have two identities, please. Okay. At least, um, right, many. All right, Pat. Thank you. We are proposing uh, to the council, the community resources to update the nuisance bylaw new, uh, and not no longer call it nuisance house, but nuisance property. And the reason for that is there is more than the original bylaw really addresses underage drinking parties, loud gatherings, and things like that. But we, and it focuses only on renters. So as we began to the, work- The existing bylaw. The existing, that's what right. I said, okay. I think. Um, so one of the things that it, it really did was focus not on uh, owner-occupied um, homesteads or, or, or families, but only on renters. And so are you really having a hard time hearing me? No, okay, thank you. Um, and as it became also clear that, so we wanted to be able to address any resident in town. 
uh, if they're creating a public nuisance. We also wanted not to simply penalize people, but to actually, and we're gonna go through this in just a second, I'm sorry, but we actually wanted to find ways to collaborate and change uh, behaviors and stuff. So if we look at this, go ahead, I'm, I'm sorry. So. Yeah, so the proposed would be violations of state law and local zoning bylaws and general bylaws. The occupants, whether they are renters or owners, would be, or people in charge, the property managers, would be notified. Um, enforcement would be police officers and inspection services. Right now, it is only police officers mm -hmm. and um, inspection services are not involved, although they are involved in other bylaws. Uh, the penalty is the same. It's $300 per violation. If the designation um, of a nuisance property, uh, there are three or more violations during the year, um, then they uh, would be um, uh, named a nuisance property and other sanctions could go. Pat, move into your mic, please. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and again, as I said earlier, before I looked up at this thing, is we're really looking for corrective plans with the possibility of removal of nuisance designations after six months. Um, so I think that's basically what's going on. Uh, we are trying to integrate this or, or uh, weave into it uh, because of the relationship with the rental registration bylaw which also has inspection sanctions and things like that. This, a nuisance property can happen because of underage drinking parties that are allowed. It, in our proposal, it, will ha it would integrate uh, bylaws like snow and ice removal, uh, th vegetation, things that can be uh, hazardous to people. Uh, and if those things aren't remediated, then what do we do? Right now, what happens is a lot the town goes in and fixes it. Uh, and this would be a, a bit different than that. Excuse okay. Me. <laughs> uh, let me see. I'm trying to. Um, we had, a, as we worked on this in CRC, we had a great deal of input from the uh, Chief Ting and from also the Building Commissioner, Rob Mora. Uh, and both of them feel that this new bylaw, the new version, gives them more flexibility in responding to residents. Um, not just to complaints, but to, in essence, build relationships with residents who are having issues either with uh, partying or having issues maybe pr uh, maintaining their property or things like that. So how can we address that more effectively as a community? Um, I, and I, there has been some concern um, that there's uh, too much interweaving of other bylaws. Uh, but um, one of the things that happened, I'll, I'll share a quick story from CRC. The, the bylaws, it was written by its sponsors, um, said that you couldn't have uh, household furniture on your property, that that was... And I, I felt like, whoa, wait, if I want to stick a you know, couch on, in my yard, I can stick a couch in my yard. Uh, but it be, could become a health issue if there's rain, if there's mold, if there's things like that. But there's already a bylaw in the health department that, require, that would take care of that. So there, this interweaving that has um, provoked some consternation and concern and, and um, really is trying to find a way to give residents as enough information about what, uh, what constitutes a nuisance property and what is the process both to fix the issue, but long-term to change the uh, behavior of residents. So, so the floor is open for questions. We have a couple here. And Bernard, and then we're going to start with Bernard, and then we'll go over. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Bernard Brennan, Northeast Street. It occurs to me that there are certain predictable, I'll call them nuisance events that happen on an annual basis. Right. Um, so the six month part of this might not work. Something like a pre inspection before the next version of that happens. And the specific use case I'm thinking of is like Fourth of July related fireworks. Um, 
they reliably happen in certain locations and how could you address that even preemptively? Yeah. Thanks. One of the things is if you if the designation develops over time, there are three instances in within a year. But it's the uh, year from the date of the first violation. So that extends over some changes in property. And I'm not sure. Well, what I'm you're suggesting about what happens. And stuff. Right. Okay. What happens if there's a firework every year for the last three years at the same property? This oh, okay. wouldn't necessarily so you're not deal with about that. the town fireworks. No, 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 no. Yeah. I'm, I'm talking about <laughs> illegal but repeated right. uh, town fire. I mean, that, you can call it nuisance at the time. That interferes. But you could be more proactive. Right. Yes, we can. And this enables us to be more proactive. Uh, one of the things is it, because it, it starts a process. It really starts a process. So if it happens three times in a year, those fireworks, that property is now labeled a nuisance property. And not just the renters, but the owners of that property are liable to repair. Okay. In essence. Uh, we, this over here? Not, not the best answer, but. Uh, the, the year, is it 12 months or calendar year? It is based on, it is based on when the first violation occurs. And so if it happens in January 1st, then it would be the full year. If it happens- And what April are the consequences 15th, of being designated a nuisance property? There are fines that can be leveled for each and those fines can affect not just the renter or the uh, prop, but also the property owner. So if it's a management company that's involved, they can be fined. Uh, if there's consistent calls for uh, police or fire uh, intervention and things like that, then response costs can be uh, applied also to this. If, if the tenant is making the problem why would you find the landlord? Okay, if the landlord is not following through on the procedure of meeting with the tenant and meeting with the town to let us know what's well, happening. the landlord tells the problem. tenant, don't do it, and they keep doing it. What is the landlord supposed to do then? I, I If I had a tenant like that and I were a landlord, I would think about um, evicting them. Eviction takes about six months right. and is very expensive. Right. And the only thing a a judge will allow is non-payment of rent. You won't get anywhere <clears throat> with the problem of noise. That is it, totally ineffective. The only way to get rid of a tenant is to pay them to leave. That's the most <laughs> practical. <Yeah. laughs> so I think the fine should be on the person making the noise. If the landlord speaks to the tenant, fine, but that is not going to necessarily change it. They can stop renting to undergraduates. Yeah, the fine first affects the tenant getting a rent of property. Absolutely. The, so does the second and the third. Uh, but we, the involvement of the management company, if, they're, if they are meeting with the tenants, if they're trying to cooperate with the town, they're not going to be penalized. They're penalized if they don't follow through and meet with their tenants and things like that. And how do you collect the fine from a tenant who who is really a resident of Boston? <laughs> I don't have an answer for that. Um, Thank the you. fine, the first fine that they get, those fines have to have to be paid. I, I don't know what happens. That's a really good question. These are great questions. Thank you. Yeah. Really. Yeah. They do they pay the town or do they pay? No, they should the be they paying pay the, the town. town. They pay the town. It's like having a ticket. It's basically like having a ticket for your car, and that gets paid to the town. Uh, inspection fees, if they're violations that are found through the nuisance property, those fee, those uh, violations, those uh, charges, those fees are paid to the town. Thank you. Yeah. Carol, uh, there's a question here. Carol and then Liz. Okay, Liz, way back. Liz Haygood, I just wanted to respond to the gentleman's questions and I'm not sure if I'm for 
or against this, but um, <laughs> um, if in fact there is a um, change in whatever this proposal is, there can also be written in the tenant agreement that any violations of these things could be terminated. So it doesn't necessarily have to be the court. You can terminate them based on them being against, um, against their contract. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Carol, did you have a question? Wasn't really a question. I was just thinking that what Bernard suggested doesn't seem to me like it gets covered by what you're saying because it's something that happens in July, and you know it's going to happen next July, which is more than a year. So okay. your first thing was one year, and your second thing is the next year, right. and your third thing is three years later. But it's all the same offense, and it seems like there is no what what the things that you're proposing, which are great, but there doesn't provide for that. I don't think the kind right. of thing that Bernard was talking about. That's all. Right. Well, there are, and, and thank you. There are meetings that have been set up between management companies and their tenants uh, uh, in terms of expected behaviors. The university has also um, met and with students and continues to meet with students about expected behavior. Uh, and that works more often than it doesn't work often. And so that seems to me to be an issue that could be included. Um, it also, you know, I'm trying, you know, I'm assuming you're saying it's the same household who's setting off the fireworks once every, yeah. And, um, yeah. And my suggestion would be to talk to that household, to talk to the people before July 4th. Um, but I hear what you're saying about. Yeah. yeah. It's a once a year occurrence. Um, No, you can always call the police, okay? You can always call the police. You can always call the town. You know what? First, it would be really good if a lot of us walked over to our neighbors and said something and talked. I, what I have found, and I have student housing you know, around me in my neighborhood, et cetera, is that students are not unresponsive. And if they are, then you can contact the landlord. You can talk... I think there are things that can be done before the police, but the police or the building inspector need flexibility in terms of how they intervene and how they work with people. Uh, Carol. I want to also allow Jennifer Tobb to come in and unmute. Yeah, she'll do it Jennifer is one of the uh, people that's on the committee that has been dealing with this. And was also one of the original sponsors. So okay. Jennifer. Yes, thank you, Lynn. Um, no, I did want to respond a couple of questions ago. Uh, there was a question about, you know, um, should the property owner be responsible for the behavior of the tenant? And a part of what this new um, uh, revised nuisance bylaw is trying to do, as Pat said, is really get to the corrective action plan. So at when there's a second call, um, a nuisance call is made to the police department, then the property owner is notified that this, that their tenant, um, there's been some misbehavior. And so, you know, hopefully the property owner or management company at that point would have a conversation with the tenants. And then at the third call, um, nuisance call, the property owner or the management company through the inspections department would be asked and required to develop um a corrective action plan. So that gets the property or owner or the um, landlord in a conversation with the tenant and the inspections department to come up with a corrective action plan that then the three parties would be working together to implement. And um, I represent district four, which are two campus adjacent neighborhoods. And I've seen in my neighborhood when the property owner works with the tenant and with the inspections department, houses that have been nuisance properties. These are, you know, they are usually almost always student rental houses. And there's some houses that even though the tenants 
change year after year. The house is a, ha, you know, is seems to be the source of a lot of um, noise and nuisance calls. And once the, the three entities, even before this bylaw, it's been on a voluntary basis, but when the landlord works with the tenant, you know, with some involvement in inspections, they have properties that for years have been nuisance are no longer. So this is really a way that is to get everyone working cooperatively together. And it's, again, as Pat said, the um, it's not trying to be punitive, but to have a correction, corrective action plan. And in that way, the landlord can be assume a level of responsibility for a house um, transitioning from a nuisance to a good neighbor without there having to be a lot of um, financial penalties. That would be the goal, not to have the fines, but to have the behavior change. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go to Pam Rooney. He is also on this committee. Uh, Pam, go ahead. You need to unmute. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, I think Pat did a great job explaining this bylaw. Uh, and, and Jennifer, thanks for adding that. Uh, the idea of um, a persistent issue, whether it's the persistent a uh, house that is never maintained, uh, the garbage cans are never brought back inside. Um, you know, that could be an owner occupied house as well as uh, a rental property. Um, the word persistent is probably one of the key elements here. Having a strengthened bylaw, because we've, we've had the nuisance house for years and years, um, it, that again, as Pat said, that focused just really much on, on, on drunken parties and boisterous and boisterous folks. Uh, so this is this is broader. And the idea of having a a, a corrective action and an ongoing conversation, I think will, bring about change. I, I was thinking about the, the the man who said, well, what happens if they just keep repeating because there's nothing you can really do? You can't evict them. You certainly could say after this year, you're, we're not going to rent to you next year. Um, but I think having the ongoing conversation with that owner, with the with the occupants and with perhaps the managers, um, I'm hoping we'll make we'll make a difference. Okay, Thanks. we have a question in the audience. I'm hoping no, people I... on Zoom can hear us now that we're using the mic. Go ahead. Can okay, you can, can you hear me all right? Um, can, it is on. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. okay. Um, I I I'm sure the committee working on this knows what it's doing. I imagine you've looked into these issues. I don't want to express any um, distrust here, but there are some things that are that are not clear. Um, I would only suggest that you make sure you're on the right side of state law and federal mm -hmm. fair housing law. I have been told in my limited experience renting that a landlord can't turn anyone away except for inability to pay or violation of, of um, uh, the, the number of people allowed in the house and so forth. You can't just say, you haven't behaved well, so I'm not going to rent to you again. That's that's not lawful to, to my knowledge. Perhaps I'm wrong here. Um, likewise, uh, things can be written into a lease agreement, but if they violate state or federal law, they are not enforceable. So I would want the committee to be very careful about um, about the state of landlord-tenant law before proceeding. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments from on Zoom or in the audience on this? Okay. Uh, before we just go to general comment, I wanna make sure if there's anybody who has questions about the Valley Clean Energy effort, we have postcards in the room. This is an effort that has been worked on by Amherst, Pelham and Northampton. It actually, you are automatically in unless you opt out. 
as long as you receive your energy, your electricity from Eversource. And what it does is increase some of the energy use is more reliant on solar or other alternative energy sources. Okay. So if there's other issues people would like to bring up, please raise your hand. This is feeling like the end of a council meeting. I could call for a movement to adjourn. Maybe yes, you want to move to adjourn? No, yes. We have a question in the audience here in the town room. Yes. I have an answer for you. Yeah. Yes, and I have taken your questions. I d went to the town manager and I'm right now um, looking for his response. Um, okay, his response is the following. This is the issue of rental permits because we put in the new law for, he said, we have ex always expected the permit issuance to take longer this year and mentioned that in the last notice that went to our group contact list. The revised bylaw resulted in us having to create a new permit application system requiring different information than was gathered previously. The system is very sim simple but will take more time for the applicant to submit and our staff to review than in prior years. This will only occur in the first year when all the required data is being collected and we are building the property profile to connect land use permits, parking plans, and management plans. We have received 1,182 permit applications and completed review of approximately 500 so far. As we fill our vacant positions in October, things will speed up and we'll hopefully complete our work on all the submitted applications sometime in November. Okay, I am forwarding that question on what will what will what do you expect them to look at when they come to inspect? Yes, thank you. Absolutely. Are there any other questions or issues from the audience, Liz? Hello? Oh, there it is. So when exactly is all the road construction surrounding my house going to be done? <laughs> because to take 20 minutes to get the 2.6 miles from my house to the high school is a little ridiculous in the morning. It's starting to get weary and taxing. I'm not sure why it is we got to put three rotaries on Heatherstone. I'm just perplexed by that. And I know that Route 9 or parts of Route 9 belong to the state, not the town. But they're tearing up my cars. And, you know, I have five cars between my children and my husband and myself. And um, we pay a lot of uh, excise tax in February when that bill comes and it's starting to get weary. I couldn't agree more. Um, let me, you know, when it will stop, it will stop when we finally hit cold weather because the plants will stop operating at that point. So there won't be any more macadam they can use to do the roads. Today, when uh, now I say that very seriously, and I'm not, I'm trying not to be sarcastic. The reality is because we are not the big municipalities, okay? 
they kind of get priority on when it's going to happen. Oh, no, they have to wait for us to have all our students back and for everybody in the fall. And that's when we do our roads in Amherst. And so that's number one. And I there's no excuse except it's when we our our number came up. And the second thing is we do own the part of Route 9 that's being worked on now. We own from the center of town to the Belcher Town line. And uh, after that, the state owns Route 9 in Belcher Town, and the state owns Route 9 from the center of town to the Hadley line and then on through Hadley. Somewhere back in the dark ages, somebody convinced the town to take over the piece between the center of town and the Belcher Town line. And nobody has been able to tell me why on earth we wanted it. Because, no, and for, now there's a road question. Could we give it back? Yes, that, I think we'd like to do that. Um, that's number one. Uh, the, with regard specifically to the um, Heatherstone, uh, because of the issues that have been raised about the roundabouts, they put off the final paving today and there's, I guess, some additional other side street problems as well. Uh, whenever each or any of you have written me with any of your pictures, your observations, and your questions, I have immediately forwarded them so that, and in fact, it was because of some of those today that they didn't go ahead with the paving. And um, they have called attention to the fact that at one of the rotaries, very small rotaries, people are coming up and instead of going right and around the rotary, they're turning left as if it was a regular intersection. So, um, so stay, yeah, stay tuned on the rotary situation in Heatherstone. And then let me just say, for those of you that live on Flathills, Shutesbury Road, or if you live in the Grantwood area, it's not that we aren't advocating for our roads. We are. It's just that somehow or another, our number hasn't come up. And it's, again, we send the pictures. We ask for explanations. The bottom line is we just don't have enough money. And when you don't have money, you can't get the help. So that's it. I, it there's no excuse for our roads. Absolutely none. I totally and completely agree with you. No excuse for our building. No, there isn't. Are there other questions or comments? Actually, Michael Childs would like to come in. I'm, and I'm going to, Michael, allow you to talk. Please go ahead. Unmute. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, so just to follow up on the road situation here, uh, we thank you for getting uh, part of Heatherstone done and open all. <laughs> but <laughs> is there some assurance we can have that uh, next year uh, the other half of Heather Stone will be done? And we can't can you speak into the microphone. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? That's better. I yes, think. but you need uh, to be, it was mumbled. Okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, so um, is there any assurance we can get that the other half of Heather Stone will be done next year and that Stony Hill will be done next year? There's a dangerous situation on Stony Hill where there's many potholes and people are getting in the left lane to get around the potholes. Sooner or later, they're going to face a car coming the other way and there'll be a collision. So I have not seen the list for next uh, fall. We will ask, I mean, for next spring, we will ask for it. And when we get it, we will send it out. So Thank I you. have no idea what's on the list following mm -hmm. what we're presently looking at. The, the other uh, question I had was, could you please give us an update on the status of the library? The bids went out uh, last week. They are expected uh, on October 30th, I believe, or 31st. And at that point, uh, we'll know whether or not the amount of money the council has authorized will cover the uh, library um, project or not. And if it does, then it will proceed. And if it doesn't, then there's some hard choices to be made. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Are there any other issues people would like to ask? Renee? No. Okay. 
we have lawn signs for the Shutesbury Road project sitting in the town room. If you want one, please let me know or Renee Moss know and they'll make sure you get one. <laughs> actually, you, you, you actually can bring signs into the room. What you can't do is hold them up in a way that prevents somebody seeing. So thank you for that. Next time you come in, stand in the back with the sign. Yeah, there we go. Are there any other comments? Thank you. Uh, we will evaluate whether we thought this was an effective yeah. way to meet or whether we should just go back to either you meet in person or you meet by Zoom. What do you guys think real quick? Yeah. Okay. You like the option. I think what we have to do, however, is address better. The people on Zoom have not always been able to hear everybody. And that's, that's an issue. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, thanks, Thank you, and have a good evening. Thank you, everyone. And, uh...